<laughs> well, welcome, okay, everybody. welcome. <laughs> to Centerstat Unscripted, our culmination episode for this spring season, because we just decided a few minutes ago we won't be able to yeah, do another two one minutes this ago. spring season. And also right when we went live, Dan, you can't see because I'm not going to tilt the camera, but Dan pre uncapped the pens. These for pens easy are like weirdly hard. To They're make. really hard. And right when we went live, I, I slammed my hand down, but it didn't work quite so well. And the pen shot all yeah. over the table. So <clears throat> we're, we're good to go. Who the hell are we? I'm Patrick Curran. I am Dan Bauer. And welcome to Centerstat <laughs> Clearly Unscripted. <laughs> Uh, today's episode, what we're going to do is continue our exploration of heterogeneity in populations, um, this time back to observed variables, and this time expanding upon um, what we talked about earlier, where we had heterogeneity as a function of groups. Well, what if you have a variable that is not a grouping variable, but where you believe that the parameters of your model might differ as a function of level on that continuous variable? And welcome. We so appreciate you joining us. And as Dan said, this is actually going to be our last episode for the spring. We put a lot of thought, a lot of thought into this at 11.58. And it turns out that contrary to popular belief, Dan and I have day jobs and we're kind of, <laughs> kind of running out of time. And so... <laughs> This will be our last one, um, but we're, we're having a lot of fun, and I hope that, you know, folks who join us, and we really do appreciate uh, those who are able to join us live, and also anybody who's foolish enough to watch this recorded, um, is we've not helped by having, like, a different day and a different time every single time we do this. But in the fall, we'll pick a, a date and a time, and we'll keep doing it, because we're having fun. And actually, when you hit our age, that's all that matters. Yeah. Plus, we're tenured, so, so what are they going to do? Fire exactly. Maybe. No, no, no. They're going to withhold our raises. <laughs> because, <laughs> because we're going through this whole raise review. So, and we got, did you get that? We have to we do. We said we were going to minimize banter. Oh, shit, you're right. Yeah. Anyway, a really high wait time, zero dollars in the pool. You do the math. Yeah. So, as Dan said, we've been talking um, for, I guess this is the first, second, third episode on heterogeneity. So the first one was what happens if we have groups that we observe. The second was what if we have groups that we believe to exist but we did not observe. And what this one is, is um, let's go back to that observed group but expand it um, in a way that's pretty cool. Again, I always organize it so that I get to draw the first path diagram. Wasn't that nice and easy to remember? Actually, it was... <clears throat> yes. All right. So we're going to do a CFA, although um, this applies to any modeling framework. Like a lot of stuff that we do is we can generalize this across a, a whole variety of settings. But this is... What we're going to talk about today is arguably the worst acronym in all of statistics, so it's <coughs> Moderated Nonlinear <coughs> Factor <coughs> Analysis, MUVA, and the developer proposed it and the guest editor of Psych Methods approved it. I don't know how it got through that chain. He was the author and I was the guest editor. It's a really rigorous review it process. It was a really <laughs> rigorous review process. But um, it came out of what was the that Dan was working on with Andrea Hussong was a nonlinear factor analysis, which is it was a factor analysis that, that had discrete items. And it was specifically designed for that and thus moderated nonlinear factor analysis. But it generalizes to a whole host of things. And you and I have argued for like five years about renaming it, and we just never got around to it. And so that's the general term. Sometimes we can think about it in terms of um, parameter moderation, which you'll see why we call it that, but we're sticking with M and LFA for now. All right, so I'm going to do a simple CFA, and it is kind of important that we get some notation here. So lambdas represent our factor loadings. I'm going to do a double-headed uh, arrow here to represent our factor variance and psi. You don't often see this um, in path diagrams, but a triangle with a one in it uh, is represents the factor mean. That's an alpha, a psi, a lambda, and then we have theta epsilons for our residual variances. And then my favorite little guy, 
these seagulls, these are the news. And those are our item intercepts, all right? And so we have item Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4. All right, so that's the full CFA. And um, we can generalize this to more items. We can generalize it to more factors. We can have continuous and normal items, non-normal items, binary items, counts. But we can do any, anything we want, all right? Now, a big thing that we talked about in the prior episodes is when you fit this to what we now call a single group model, that is you believe your sample is a random representation of a homogeneous population. That is that there are not subgroups. When we obtain estimates for these parameters, there is one value of alpha hat, the mean of the factor, that holds for everyone. There's one value of psi, right? We throw hats over it to show sample estimates and lambdas and nus and, and theta eps. And when you start thinking about this, you're making a really strong statement about the model that you're estimating. Is that is these factor loadings hold for treatment, control, young, old, black, white, rural, urban, whatever your categories are, and whether they be discrete categories or not, continuity in terms of age or socioeconomic status or years of education, you're saying lambda is lambda is lambda. We got into Shakespeare quotes last time, I think. Is a lambda by any other name is a lambda, right? Is Come on, my mom was an English lit teacher. So it doesn't have quite the same ring as a rose. <laughs> no, it's not, but you know, work with me, man. Is not being hyperbolic, if you get an estimate of 0.68 for your factor loading, that represents the value of the loading for everyone regardless of their individual characteristics. You come up to me and say, but Patrick, I come from the treatment group. Don't care. Say it to the hand, right? That's so that, I think really, that's a little outdated. Really, yeah, 1980s. Um, don't care. Montel Treatment, Williams. control. I'm from Colorado. Oh, well done. You don't care. You get a 0.68 or whatever I said. All right. And so then we said, well, we have the multiple group approach, which is super powerful, super important. And we estimate simultaneously, not separately. We estimate simultaneously the model within group zero and within group one, and we're able to compare and contrast those loadings. So we can make this being equal across group a testable hypothesis. All right, so we make them equal, we remove the equality constraint, and we say, is there a significant difference in model fit as a function of the equality of these parameters? And only when you set everything equal across the two groups, do you get back to your single sample model? So as we noted in an earlier episode is, you know, if you never fit a multiple group model, realize that when you estimate those factor loadings, that is what you're saying. These are constant over all individual difference variables of everyone in your sample. All right, so we have the discrete group and you get a factor mean for group zero and a factor mean for group one. You get a factor variance for group zero, a factor variance for group one. And then we said at the end of that episode with the observed group, well, what if you believe these groups to exist but you didn't observe them directly? And we talked about mixture modeling. And so you can estimate how many groups there are, you can estimate the probability of each individual will be a member of each of the possible groups and so on. All right, but what we're going to do is come back and say, all right, that's cool about the observed group versus the latent group, but what if you believe some of these parameters differ not only across a grouping variable, but maybe across a continuous variable, maybe across several continuous variables, maybe across a set of covariates that um, interact with one another. All right, well, the observed group and the mixture approach is taps out. Right, that's done. It says, I'm, I'm out of here, I'll be over at the bar if you need me, all right? And they go over. The moderated nonlinear factor model is saying, no, this is cool. We can actually build a model. All right, this is weirdo day. We are gonna end the spring on weirdo day. Seems fitting. It seems fitting. Didn't we start the spring also on weirdo Just, day? Dude, I'm talking here. Is we are gonna literally build a model to predict parameters in the model. All right, this is like matrix level stuff. I don't mean matrix algebra, I mean Neo, right? Matrix the movie is 
we're going to build a model, thanks to this knucklehead's uh, developments in this area, that we predict parameters in the model. And you might be at home, wherever you are out in the world, and say, dude, you can't do that, right? You can't predict a parameter. You know what's funny? We do this all the time, all right, is let's say we have a grouping variable. I'm going to call it G, and it's just zero and one. We started this, you know, uh, multiple episodes ago. It's either zero or it's one, and we predict the intercept, and from that we get some gamma, right, the regression parameter. What does that represent? A one unit change in G is associated with a gamma unit expected change in eta. What is a one unit change moving from zero to one? All right. Well, what is the intercept of a, a regression equation? It is the mean when the predictor is zero. So this alpha, we can actually put a little alpha naught on it, right? Which means that that is the intercept, that's the mean of eta for those in group zero, and gamma is the increment to that mean for being in group one. Well, what we can do is to say, well, wait a minute. What we could do is say, what is the factor mean? And the factor mean is going to be equal to some intercept plus gamma times the grouping variable. We do this all the time. We are predicting the factor mean. All right. Now we talked about a mimic model and we said, well, you can do this and, and, and predict the item. Well, not going through at the same level of detail. Well, if this is new, is the item intercept, which is the, the mean of y1 when the predictor is zero, we can write an equation for new that is new, whoops, Oh. I know, the new you and the even gamma. Have a cheat sheet. So I don't know if you all can see this at home, but after we decided to have this be the last episode at 1258, at 1259, we decided we needed some notational scheme that was consistent with papers we've written. And so I couldn't remember it, so I wrote it over here. <laughs> all right. And now I can't even read my own handwriting. Is new is some new not, which is the item intercept when grouping is zero plus, let's call it kappa, just to keep track of things at home, gamma i. Right, this is a really big deal. We've been doing this all the time, but we really are writing a regression equation for a model parameter. Now, in the usual SEM, in a single group, we can shift alpha by g, that's weighted by gamma, we can shift nu by kappa that is, uh, yeah, is a function of g that's weighted by kappa, excuse me. And those come out of the usual estimation um, uh, procedures that we have. But notice when we're in the single group, we can shift alpha and we can shift nu, but everything else still stays the same. Right? That's, we talked about that a couple episodes ago. Psi is the same, lambda is the same, theta epsilon is the same. So we get a little bit of heterogeneity into the model, but not a ton of heterogeneity into the model. But there are two things that I want to highlight here. As soon as we get our head around the notion that we're actually using G to predict model parameter alpha, and we're actually using G to predict model parameter nu, I wonder if we could use G to predict psi, right? I love patterns. I like general rules. Well, could we write an equation for psi? Could we write an equation for lambda? Well, those are not part of the standard model, and that's where the knucklehead comes in. So that's point one, is if we can write a, an equation for alpha and nu, couldn't we do it for other parameters? And second, why limit ourselves to G? We could have X1, X2, X1 by X2, right? That we could use to predict. It looks like the latent factor, but now we're actually building out. I would just simply say plus gamma 1 X, well, that'd be gamma 2 if this is gamma 1, X1, and so on. And so there are two things that thinking in this way brings us to is maybe 
we could expand it to other parameters and maybe we could build not just a single zero one grouping, but bring in an entire set of covariates to try to understand how these model parameters are expressed across the set of individual differences. All right, the baton, AKA marker has passed. Do you want me to pre uncap it for yeah, you? Yeah, that's really tight. Can you? Uh... <laughs> Never mind. Use another color. That one was pre uncap. <laughs> it was broken. <laughs> that's what it was. It that's was broken. Give me the rag. All right, um, I'm just going to simplify a little bit here. Hey, that was my path diagram. I know, but I didn't like it. Dude. No, I mean, I liked it just fine. It just has too much in it for me. <laughs> I, mean, I like it just fine. I'm just going to redraw it. That's right. That's right. All right, so I'm going to simplify it a little bit just so I don't have so many boxes running around. Um, we still got G, right? And maybe let's take a substantive example. Maybe we're trying to measure antisocial behavior, right? So maybe Ada is antisocial behavior and Y1 is like, uh, lying and Y2 is stealing and Y3 is borrowing the car when you're not asking if you can borrow it or taking these, the neighbors. These seem like I don't know where I'm coming up with you these. You know but... a lot about these. Ah, Y4 is vandalizing. <laughs> he tried to uncap it uh... and it was already uncapped. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. You are I've a had a leader. lot on my mind lately. <laughs> you are a leader in the field. I almost brushed my teeth with uh, uh, shaving cream the other day, too. Uh, I was like, yeah. Anyway. I just noticed we're twins today. Yeah, we close, really need to. Close. Keep thinking that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's say we're trying to measure antisocial behavior. And our grouping variable is biological sex. We've got girls, we've got boys in our sample. And we have another variable in here uh, we'll say is age. Right? And we have individuals measured at different ages, and we think the factor mean is going to vary as a function of both our grouping variable and age. So this x variable over here, we'll just make that age for now. Right? And so the, the factor mean is now conditional. And actually, I'll put a little i subscript on there. Is our factor mean alpha is now the intercept here, alpha naught, plus gamma times the grouping variable. So just like in the mimic approach Patrick was describing, that's the mean increase associated with being in group one versus zero. But now we've also got age in there. And so there's another gamma, gamma two, associated with the age effect. And we can see the factor mean of, of this kind of these deviant behaviors. This factor is gonna probably go up through adolescence and maybe come down some in early adulthood. All right, well, what about age? by group, right? We could have that interaction in the model too, right? So we've got all three of those predicting that factor mean. And as Patrick described, that's fine, right? We can do that in the regular SEM because the regular SEM is well suited to model these kinds of structural relationships. And if we think that items function a little bit differently for boys versus girls, maybe boys are more you know, gonna over index on an item like rowdiness, right? Is okay, well we could we could have that effect directly on Y1 where the mean of Y1 is higher than we expect it to be given the overall level of antisocial behavior and the sex differences we've observed in the factor. Right? So we can do that and that's that's the mimic and we can do that in the mimic model. But as Patrick said, there are a lot of parameters in here we haven't touched yet. Right, so this all fits in the standard SEM, it all fits in the mimic model framework because everything is about means. The only parameters that we've allowed to, to have as a function of our external variables here are means, the mean of the factor, the mean of the item, right? Well, what if we're interested in things like factor loadings, right? What if we think that that, that item doesn't measure antisocial behavior the same way for male adolescents versus female adolescents. Okay, well, what are we gonna do? Well, we, we can't necessarily go to the multiple groups model because we also have age differences in there. And we think that there are gonna be age differences in the functioning of some of the items. So for instance, taking a car without permission tends to go up as adolescents get to around 16, which is the legal age of driving here in the United States, and then it tends to go down again as you get past that. So it's a behavior adolescents are beginning to engage in at that normative time of driving, and after they've kind of mastered that norm, then you don't see it as much. Well, that 
that behavior might be more indicative of antisocial behavior for some adolescents versus others. Well, how are we going to let these factor loadings vary as a function of age? Age is a continuous variable. The old way of doing it would be to say, oh, we'll just chop age in half. We'll make it a categorical variable, and now we'll have a categorical age variable and a categorical sex variable, and we'll just cross them, right? We'll have young, old, male, female. That gives us four groups, and we could go into the multiple groups CFA with that. But nobody likes to cut up continuous variables, right? We get beaten over the head in our stats classes that that's a terrible thing to do. We're losing lots of information. Why should we put a 12-year-old with a 14-year-old and a 17-year-old with a 19-year-old when we think there are real differences between 12 and 14-year-olds and 17-year-olds and 19-year-olds? So can we preserve the continuity of these variables and still allow for these factor loading differences? Well, in the standard SEM, we couldn't. Right, But a lot of work has been done since then to allow you to express parameters of your model as a function of external variables using nonlinear constraints in the model estimation. And how the estimation works isn't all that important for our topic today, for just thinking about these models. But what it allows us to do is say, all right, let's, let's pick a factor loading. Right? Let's pick the factor loading for Y1 and we're gonna let that factor loading, we're gonna give it a baseline value, right? And then we're gonna let that factor loading be a function. Ah, oh, now no I No omega. It. Omega, damn it. He didn't look at the cheat sheet. I didn't sheet. look at it's the cheat right Why there. do we have a cheat sheet? If because you didn't look know it. it. We right. have the cheat sheet and you got it wrong. I know. <laughs> omega of one times the grouping variable. You plus. invented this, right? I think so. <laughs> Actually, I just stole it from Mike Neal at Virginia I know, Mike Neal. He thinks of everything before anybody I, else, but I nobody know. knows that. So you can just steal it. Yeah, ideas Mike did. If you have own. a really clever idea, Mike already did it. So yeah. yeah, yeah. You'll find out like five years after you publish it. But anyway, all right. So now we've got an expression for the factor loading, much like we had expressions for the factor mean and the factor variance. And now we're off to the races, right? Because if we can build a model for any parameter of our model, right, then, okay, factor variance too. Let's build a model for that. All right, this one gets a little tricky. I was going to say is, you, <laughs> I, just this one. I want to see how Dan kind of, kind of fuzzy. He's like, we can build a model for that. And it turns out. We can. It's <laughs> just, it gets a little tricky. All right, why is this one tricky? Because variances shouldn't be negative, right? So we've used linear expressions for all these parameters. Well, that's okay, right? Means can be positive or negative. Intercepts can be positive or negative. Factor loadings can be positive or negative. But variances, uh-oh. Right? We don't want negative variances. Negative variances are a very embarrassing thing to have and have to report. Right? So we're going to use a log linear model for that factor variance. And we're going to say... Beta. 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 Thank you. Beta. <laughs> so we're going to say it has a baseline value. Check my equation here, Patrick. <laughs> I will. And then we're going to have an exponential function where we include <laughs> beta <laughs> 1 g plus beta 2 age. Right, and we could have a beta 3g times age as well. We could include those interactions. So now we allow the factor variance to change as a function of those covariates, right? So we use this log linear model because this won't return negative values. So it keeps everything positive, right? And so now we're saying, all right, let's let these variables predict the variance, right? We can even have the interaction come down there and predict the variance. So we might find that not only is the mean level of antisocial behavior higher for boys than it is for girls, and not only does it go up over the course of adolescence and then come down in young adulthood, but the variance might be much greater for the boys than it is for the girls, and the variance might go up in early adolescence and come down in later adolescence, right? And we can build models for how those factor means and variances differ at the same time that we also consider whether the measurement structure differs as a function of sex and as a function of age and so on. So this is a really big deal for two reasons. One is whack-a-mole. All right, so let's say that these relations hold in the way that Dan has drawn out here, but we don't allow it. All right, so imagine that psi, which is, the, remember, the variance of our latent factor, and so just keeping our head around, I like the substantive example of, of kind of, what do you call it, conduct disordered behavior or Antisocial something? Antisocial behavior. Antisocial yeah. behavior. Is think about this, 
because it literally is as a variable, right? And a variable has a mean and it has a variance. If these relations hold, you're saying there's just a single variance that holds for everybody. And with whack-a-mole, if this stuff exists and you don't allow it, this variance doesn't represent that value for anybody, right? It's wrong for everybody in the sample because it's so specific on these covariates. So that's part one is you're getting biased estimates. But part two, and this is where we get really excited about it, it opens up a whole new realm of theoretical questions that you can answer. That is, when you see this, again, it's like when Neo sees the matrix. And if you haven't seen the matrix, you gotta watch the first one. That's your assignment before fall, is when Neo sees the matrix, right? When you see this, at least my reaction was, wow, if all we have is this, you're just moving that intercept up and down. And you're just saying, oh, this combination has higher antisocial behavior. This combination has lower antisocial behavior. But now we can literally ask a theoretical substantive question. Is the person-to-person -person variability in antisocial behavior a function of these other things? The variance is a dependent variable in our model, and that becomes yeah. of substantive interest. And one of my favorite things, all right, so I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I'm gonna ruin more of your path diagram, Patrick. Just don't turn it upside down like you usually do. Right side up, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, is your mic not working? It's upside down. All right, so let's continue with our substantive example, and we'll say this is antisocial behavior, and it is kind of classical antisocial behavior, is kids are engaging in, uh, vandalism and stealing and taking cars and whatnot, right? Well, another dimension that we could measure oh. could be social aggression. I bet you right? don't have the and covariance got, at your fingertips. I don't, because it's way more complicated. <laughs> I want to see. He's like painting himself into a corner I at totally this point. I totally am, right? <laughs> All right, so... For this factor, just like that factor, we've got a factor mean, we've got a factor variance, we've got intercepts, we've got factor loadings. I'm just gonna pretend those don't exist, all right? Because I don't wanna mess with those. But we, we could do moderation equations for residual variances too. They'd look a lot like that, right? They'd be we like usually don't too. because nobody cares. Plus, if you're working with binary ordinal items, they just kind they of don't. disappear. They don't so, exist. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so the thing I think is really cool is when the correlation between the factors or the covariance between the factors is moderated, right? So we could have sex and we could have age and we could have sex by, I'm running out of whiteboard. I know. Here. I'm just gonna make there the goes, intercept. He's it's gone. gone, no intercept. All right, so we've got these and we can have those predict the factor covariance as well as the factor variances. I'm running out of space. So we are writing a model the spaghetti for monster. a covariance. We are yeah. predicting. You know what would really help? Could you express that covariance in equation form for me? There's some space over there. I'd really like to let you do that. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out. I cannot because, <laughs> all right, so we had to use this log linear expression for the variance because variances can't go negative. Well, there's this little thing about correlations where they can't go outside a negative one and one or that gets weird, right? And so the, the equation for that is kind of complicated because it is based on a Fisher Z transformation. So it's linear in the Fisher Z and then you got to back it's out to get the correlation kind of? and then you got to back out with those variances to get the covariance itself. And yeah, I, have I would like, like to blame that on Pat. I know, but you can't. I've can't. written like I'm, six I'm the papers using M and LFA and Dan, it's in the show notes already. I put it in there this morning, but Dan describes all of this in a 2017 psych methods paper that he did solo. And I tried to apply it in my own data and I I went into his office and I was like, I don't even know, I, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> but like, but okay, so the equation's complicated, but think how freaking cool yeah. that is substantively is you could find something like, you know, early in the life course, social aggression and other measures of antisocial behavior are really highly correlated and not very well differentiated. And as kids get older, especially girls, those differentiate. And maybe the girls are engaging in more social aggression and less of these kind of classic externalizing measures of antisocial behavior. And boys catch up later, right? And you're gonna see that in how that correlation shifts 
over time and between sex and with that interaction. That is really cool. Yeah. I, that's my favorite part of yeah. these models. And I'm just teasing on the complexity. The code is up there. This is, I mean, they're just, I just wanted to see if he could pull it out of the air. Nope, I can't. Because, no. I really can't. But to just reiterate what Dan said is think, I... <laughs> See, you should, <laughs> you should uncap it. This, this one came off easy. How's that PT going, buddy? Pre-uncapped. <laughs> pre is think about this. I'm just going to call this R21. All right, it's an oversimplification, but this is the correlation between factor two and factor one. This nonsense that Dan wrote here we can literally yeah, could think, you write the equation for that? <laughs> yes, it equals three. <laughs> um, we can literally think about predicting that correlation to one, and we have age as a predictor. It can have a nonlinear effect. You've done some crazy ass stuff with this stuff. Yeah, age can have a nonlinear. So you could put in like an age squared. Age squared. But then I'll put a shout out to uh, Dylan Molinar's done some really interesting mm. work on non-parametrically getting at that function. But you could have a model implied value of your correlation between your two factors. So the latent variables of how closely they're related that it goes down. Do you have a pre-capped one? I'll do a black. Nope, there you we go. should have gone red, man. And maybe that is for group equals zero. And then maybe we have one, I don't know, I'm just making this up. I don't even know if it's like, you know, substantively meaningful. But you could have group equals one and you have a non-linear effective age that varies as a function of group membership and you are looking at the extent to which the two factors relate to one another over time. And so for some kids, at some ages, these begin to uncouple, right? They start to uncouple, where for other kids, they don't. And this is a big thing, like in developmental psychopathology, their interventions on child behavior, where um, they talk sometimes in the literature about two negative behaviors becoming coupled together, right? Is that you have like school failure and aggressive behavior. And aggressive kids fail in school because they're being taken out of the room, they're not paying attention, they're not doing homework. But as they begin to fail, they don't get pro-social feedback, they begin to affiliate with delinquent peers, and that drives more aggressive behavior. And you can think about it. I had one guy describe it to me once, John Cooey. He was a very famous uh, preventive interventionist, and I had the honor of having an office next door to him when I was at, at Duke when I started my career. But he, he thought about these behaviors as like being zippered together mm. for certain kids, and once they crystallize, then it becomes too late. You can't unhook them. Well, imagine making a testable hypothesis where you have a control group and a treatment group, and you look at those correlations between the two behaviors over time, and a successful treatment is those correlations get weaker because you're unhooking them, you're unzippering those, those mutually kind of feedback, you know, negative behavior loops. And back in the day when he was telling me, and he would say, how do you test that? And I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, I gotta pick up my kids. And John said, you don't have kids yet. They won't come until 2004. And I said, you're right, I lied. Is we now have a model where, for example, group one could be treatment and group two could be control. And a successful treatment is that you've weakened the correlation between two target behaviors. And we've never had a mechanism where we could directly evaluate. There are different ways you could you know, get after this, but not what this is, what I love and this shows, and I know this is starting to look like nonsense, but um, methods that we had up till now were much more ad hoc, right? Is you could take 10 year olds and compute a Pearson product moment correlation between the scale scores of these two, right? Add up these four, add up these four, compute the correlation for 10 year olds, compute the correlation for 11 year olds, compute the correlation for 12 year olds, and just look at the correlations. But here we're fitting a formal parametric model 
where we haven't highlighted yet, but each of these gammas are estimated parameters and kappas and size and betas and omegas. I love the little omegas too. They each have a standard error. They have a critical ratio. They have a p-value. And we can say there is a significant group by quadratic age effect where not only do we observe these differences in the correlation, but these are significantly larger than we would expect by chance alone. Now, to throw back to you, mm -hmm. okay wise guy, how the hell do you start with this model and build this model <laughs> in a principled way. Oh, you want like model building to? I would like or? model building. All right. Right, well, because where does all this come from? Yeah, so there are a few strategies that we've kind of played around with. So one strategy is to say, all right, well, let's, let's approach this problem by breaking it down into simpler steps. So we're gonna build up to this. And we're gonna build up to it first by saying, all right, let me just peel off one factor at a time. All right, so I'm gonna start with just this one factor. And now let me regress the factor mean and variance on my external variables, but not mess with the measurement structure yet. So we're just building in what's sometimes called impact, right? So does the factor mean, does the factor variance, is it a function of these variables? Right? And then we kind of try to settle on what's a reasonable impact model. And then we go in here and we say, all right, what about these intercepts and slopes? Do they need to be conditioned on these external variables? Is there measurement invariance or do we see differential item functioning? Those are the terms you hear. Well, what we started out doing was saying, well, okay, let's pick one item at a time and assume all the other items don't need to be conditioned on these background variables. So we're gonna to refer to them as anchor items, right? So Y2, Y3, and Y4 would all be anchor items, and we test the intercept and the factor loading of Y1 and whether it needs to be a function of the covariates. Okay, and then we go to Y2 and we treat Y1, Y3, Y4 as anchor items, and we tested the intercept and slope. And so we're using these multiple steps to try to figure out for which of these items do we need to allow intercepts and slopes and maybe residual variances to be conditioned on these background variables. And then once we get to all that, we've done all that, then we say, okay, now let's just put it in on those spots where it really made a difference in terms of our likelihood ratio testing. Then we can couple it with having done the same thing for the other factor, social aggression, and now we can add this covariance and see whether it needs to be conditioned on these background variables. So breaking the problem down into these kind of smaller steps and along the way, and we, we can't really get into it now, but there are ways of trying to do some data visualization to guide, you know, if you're gonna regress the factor mean on age, should you use a linear function? Should you use a quadratic function? You know, what would be the appropriate function to specify there? So we're gonna break it up in those steps. Another way to do it, and this is something that uh, some students and I have been exploring more recently, is to say, well, let's, let's start out with this big model, right, that potentially has all of these differences in it, differences in intercepts, differences in factor loading, differences in factor mean, differences in factor variances, and let's make adding moderation, right, so having a moderation of the factor loading or having moderation of the intercept, let's make that expensive to put in our model, right? So when we fit our model, we're gonna get a likelihood Right? And we're gonna penalize that likelihood for the addition of any moderation parameters, for saying that factor loading needs to be a function of age, that intercept needs to be a function of age. Okay, maybe, but I'm gonna make that expensive. So to keep that in the model, it better really improve the fit to the data. That's an approach referred to as regularization. We fit the whole big model, but we penalize these parameters to reward sparsity. Right? So we, we really don't want to find that every single factor loading needs to be a function of age. Every single intercept is going to need to be a function of age. We'd like to have some of these items be anchor items that measure the factor the same way for everyone at all time points. Right? So we kind of want that to be sparse. And regularization says, yeah, I'm going to help you make this sparse because I'm going to make the addition of these parameters expensive. Right? They really got to do a lot in terms of improving the fit of the model to the data for me to keep them in there. Otherwise they cost too much and I'm gonna zero them out, right? 
And so that's something we've been exploring a lot lately. And one thing that's nice about that is, as opposed to the multi-step build it up approach, it's a sort of easier on the user, is that's all implemented in the likelihood, so you just feed it the data. You tell it, okay, these are my items, this is my factor, my items are binary, or my items are ordinal, or whatever they might be. These are my background variables, now go off and fit the model. And it does its thing, and it chooses how big that penalty should be based on things like looking at the BIC, and then it says, okay, this is what come out, right? We need the moderation here, but we don't need it here, we don't need it here, we don't need it there. All right, so it, it's a little easier on the user because you just hit run and off it goes, right? We played with it in a frequentist flame framework. We have played with it in a Bayesian framework. There's a nice R package that a, a former student of mine developed, Will Belzac, called Regdiff um, that you can download off CRAN and it, it will do that penalized likelihood for you so that you can say, oh, you know, this is the pattern of effects that it looks like I need to have in my factor analysis model. And so hopefully that makes it a little bit easier to use these things in actual practice. So I got a couple questions for you that mm -hmm. came across the transom. Um, I would say you have two minutes, but you just ignore me anyway. I so, do. Um, identification and sample size issues. Yeah. Yeah, those are issues. <laughs> <laughs> do you see what it's like working with this guy? I know, right. <laughs> um, yeah, sample size needs to be kind of big, right? Because we're trying to do complicated things, and so if you're if your sample size is, is not very large, it's going to be hard to do this. Now, it's really difficult to say how big a sample size needs to be to fit a given model. Um, so I can't give you a good answer on that one. I guess you try it, and if the model cries and goes home, you say, okay, I couldn't do it. Um, so large sample sizes are important. Identification, I, this is this point we're rivaling the spaghetti monster, yeah, aren't we? Um, identification is by analogy to the multiple groups context. So what we typically do in these models is one of the, one of the identifications is we've got to scale the latent factors. We've got to set the mean and variance of these latent factors somewhere, somehow, because they don't have an observed scale. And so what we will typically do is we'll set this alpha zero to zero, and we'll set this psi not not to one. And what that does is it standardizes the latent factors when all predictors are zero, right? So that would be zero and that would be zero and we would get a mean of zero. This would be zero and that would be zero, we would get a variance of one. So that's how you can scale the latent factors to identify that part of the model. And then the factor analysis part of the model is identified the same way as any CFA. So if we have you know, four items, that's sufficient to identify the model. We can't have diff everywhere, because if there's diff everywhere, if all the factor loadings vary, if all the intercepts vary, then it becomes impossible to differentiate differences in measurement from differences in the latent factor. So we ideally have a minority of items with differential item functioning, and how small that needs to be is kind of a subjective decision. But you can't have diff everywhere and also have impact everywhere. It just doesn't work. Um, so that's another, I guess, identification condition is you can't have everything all at once. Um, but yeah, so it basically works the same way as in the multiple group model, where often in a multiple group model we will standardize the factors in a reference group and then estimate the means in a contrast group. So we're sort of standardizing these at a reference level where all covariates are zero and then estimating how do the means and variances change from there. And because these are going to be standardized where all covariates are zero, put the zero somewhere meaningful, right? So don't use age 12 to 19, right? Because then zero is going to be for a newborn, right? Center your age variable at some meaningful age like, I don't know, 16 in that context so that it's standardized for 16-year-olds and you have more interpretable um, model parameters. To make a point that you passed through to get to where you were going is <clears throat> Dan shows this, <clears throat> excuse me, in his 2017 paper, but I'm too lazy to wash all that off and redraw it. So just picture in your mind's eye, go back to one factor that I started out with and go back to the single G predicting <clears throat> the intercept and, and uh, or the latent factor in the item, right? So just a single G. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Did you smoke another is, pack of cigarettes? I, under the table here. Is 
It's zero, one, single G. All right, we can do that in the multiple group. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. You get a lambda in group zero and group one. You get an alpha in group zero and group one. You get a psi in group zero and group one. If you do an MNLFA with a single predictor that's binary, it mimics the multiple group. And this is really neat because it, I like having things that you can tie stuff to, right? I like having general things that, that like sub-models that we're used to live within that. And so if any of you have had multi-level modeling, if you have a multi-level model with no random effects at level two, that is a multiple regression model. It's a subset of that. Well, here, have a single factor, a single binary predictor, use the entire architecture of MNLFA, and it mimics. It doesn't like approximate. It's not, you would write the same discussion. It replicates what the multiple group model would be. And what I like that is it's kind of like pounding a nail into the board and saying, all right, we're starting with our usual multiple group model, and now we can generalize it and all the ways that, that we do. So I like that a lot, and you do demonstrate that in your 2017 paper. Um, you actually read the stuff I write. That's I read the abstract. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, the other thing, all right, you know what? I actually am, I'm gonna do it. Well, is, you can't just add something? To yeah, it? <laughs> it's a, sure. It's actually, a work of art. Yeah, so I'm going to clarify now oh of boy. this, oh boy. is imagine oh that you boy. have multiple time points. All right. This will be auction. Recap later. these. Yeah, exactly. Yes, master. This is, uh, um, yeah, we got, a, we got a nice, I was going to come up with some artist, but I can't come up with his name. Um, Banksy. It's a Banksy piece. That's it. All right. So I'm not even cleaning it well. No. There are two motivations, in my eyes at least, for um, using this. And why it's important that they're in my eyes is that I have the marker right now. So I get to say whatever yeah, I feel like. see if like. you can open it. There, I you know, it. there is no love loss that this is the last episode <laughs> of the spring. Is, I think it's a good thing. Let's say that... How much do I want to go into this at 12.50? Not very it's much. Getting, yeah. Is, let's just go back to that one factor. All right, and we're gonna do this, and we're gonna do this, all right? And we've got four items, but imagine that, you know, we have more items, we have more factors, we have more time points, whatever it is that you want. We talked about in a prior episode, I don't know if we did, but I'm gonna say that we did. Yeah, no one will is, watch Nobody anyway. will remember this, is, you can estimate this natively, right? Meaning that we estimate the, the latent model directly and we do anything that we do with that in terms of a full SEM or mediation or whatever we want. But there are times where we have models in which we can't support a full latent variable model, right? Imagine that we have eight repeated measures and we want to do a latent curve model. And we have four items per factor, we have eight repeated measures, we have two constructs, you can't estimate it. All right, and so what we can do is get a scale score. And we talked about that, we called it a factor score, all right, and we called it eta hat sub i. And it's an alternative to computing a mean. We can just add up the four and divide by four, but if we do this factor score, then we factor in lambda one and lambda two and lambda three and lambda four and theta and nu and psi and alpha, all the other goodies, all right? But as we've seen over three episodes now, is if we do that, but there are individual differences that move the lambda size alpha nu's and thetas around, this is a biased score. We don't want to take that mean or that factor score and take it to another setting because it's going to bake in those uh, uh, biases. And this is actually, ironically, in the last two minutes, is where we've done most of our work, yes, yes. is I, I got a little off track. As I was saying, there are two purposes to these models. The first is to understand the theoretical psychometric model that underlies a set of measures, right? As if you're looking at acculturation, if you're looking at developmental differences, if you're looking at racial differences, is to understand the nature of how your items are expressed as a function of the hypothesized underlying model. The other one is a little bit more mechanical, but is no less important 
is we have some set of covariance. And go nuts, man. Have multiple predictors, have binary, have counts, have continuous, have interactions, have whatever you want. Go nuts on building the model in the way that we described, whether you use regularization or nested LRTs. In the show notes, I listed a bunch of papers, and in some of those, we literally describe step by step how you go about doing this. But you build all of this and you take a deep breath and say, ha, ah, okay, I got that done. I'm going to use that entire thing to get a better A to hat sub I. All right, we have one A to hat that ignores covariates. And we have one that in some of our papers we call covariate informed. And we factors. stole this idea from Miss Levy. Yeah, Miss Levy did this in the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, it might have been 90s. 90s? Okay, Maybe. yeah. 87, 83, um, somewhere in there. Yeah, is, <laughs> we have a wonderful um, uh, colleague here named Dave Thyssen, and one of his general rules is never say you're the first to do anything because someone has always done it before you have. But my point is, is we can build this as a giant calculator to get better factor scores than we would if we ignored individual difference variables. And again, as our field is becoming more and more sensitive and attuned to subgroup differences, to racial and ethnic differences, to all of these really important individual differences, it's becoming less and less satisfying to rock back and forth and say there's one eta, there's one eta, there's one eta, there's one eta. Is we have a whole infrastructure now that we can bring to bear to fine tune it. That's how sometimes I think about it, is each person comes up with their unique set of, of covariates, goes up to the counter, and the person behind the counter plugs in their unique combination of covariates, determines their unique values of lambda, alpha, psi, theta, epsilon, nu, pulls a crank, and gives you an eta hat, and then the next person comes up and does the same thing again. It's and like this is very... Personalized measurement. Pardon me? It's like personalized measurement. Personalized measurement. Now, and Peter commented on this before, but because it comes up repeatedly, is you got to pay the reaper, is I got very excited about these. Dan and I and colleagues have written probably more papers than we needed to on this topic. Um, and I listed some of these in the show notes. I'm become... Before you run it down, though, you have a paper that I read the abstract of <laughs> where you show, I mean, to some extent it's fine tuning, but you show that when you do it this way, you get much better reproduction of no. relationships to other outcomes, yep. other variables. That you, like you take these factor scores and you're gonna do stuff with them. And the stuff you do is gonna be less biased if you've tuned them, personalized them, with respect to the covariates than if you ignored those covariates and got I those I kind of forgot scores. about that yeah, point. Yeah, that was a nice one. Because there are two ways we can think about these scores. One is, and we do a lot of simulation work on you get the factor score, but in a simulation we have a true score, and you look at how similar are these to one another. And if they're really similar, you say, ha ha, see, I got it. But we never do that. Nobody cares. What we do is we have a path model or we have a growth model or something like that. And so you're exactly right is when you do this and these play a role and what we did find was and in subsequent analysis you also have those covariates in the model, mm -hmm. which of course we do because it's biological sex and racial group and age like we carry those forward. If you do it without bringing those in and then bring the covariates to this, you get like bias out the wazoo. All right, it's kind of frightening. Now I'm gonna run it down. Now play the reaper. Is um, you gotta kind of pick your battles, all right? Because this is very complicated. We talked about model building a little bit. Is it is really challenging to say what is the optimal impact and diff to put in. And then each of these uh, coefficients, right, each of these are estimated, and they're estimated with some degree of precision. And if we did a thought experiment, and let's say this covariate, you know, effect was 0.58, right, that was our sample estimate, and that goes, I like that term, personalized. It's like the personalized medicine yeah, with yeah. the people who do real science. Right, it makes us it sound is, like real science. It scientists. makes us sound like real science. But 
this weight goes into the personalized estimate for this individual. Well, let's say we did a thought experiment and repeated it exactly the same, but with a new randomly drawn sample. This might be 0.46, and if we did it again, it might be 0.72. And we did it again, and maybe it's 0.91. There's a whole distribution of these, and that one, if you're quanti and looking for some interesting work to do, is I think trying to incorporate that in this in some way. Yeah. Because this score is very influenced by these values. And this is only as good as these yeah. values are. And we, we thought at one point about, well, maybe we should like do a parametric bootstrap. And then we were like, that sounds hard. So it'd be a good dissertation. It'd be a good dissertation to that. bootstrap that. Um, I, did, I did a bootstrap in one of the papers um, with two replications. <laughs> that's, that's not a It was hard. It is. It is a bootstrap. Now, granted, the literature recommends one to 2,000, and so I'm willing to admit it was not as rigorous as it yeah, could have been. Yeah. Um, but um, it was running day, and I had to go for a run. And you so gotta I, have your priorities. I did too. Speaking of which, we are going long, and I don't know, you might have a run later today. <laughs> we should probably let people go. Um, so just on behalf of both of us, thank you so much if you've joined us this semester, if you're watching these videos. Uh, we've had a lot of fun. We've hope yeah. we've had some fun. Maybe found a few informative tidbits along the way. These diagrams have been super helpful, I think. Yes, super yeah. helpful. Yeah. Um, and uh, no, I echo all of that with, with Dan and we've had a lot of fun here and we're going to start back up in the fall. And so we will, you know, do this on a more regular basis and keep picking away at it. Um, go to centerstat.org. We got a bunch of other free stuff and we got some not so free stuff. We offer workshops both live and, and asynchronously. Hancock and I have a four day class in measurement. We don't get into M and LFA in the spring class, but you know, we talk uh, about, we do get into moderation to varying degrees and um, you've got the mixture class. We have the free SEM class coming up in May. Yeah. That you would sooner than you'd see like to think. Then, uh, yeah, we don't have the date. I think maybe May seventh. Sure, we'll go with we'll that. We'll go with that. And um, I don't think you're right, actually. It might be May tenth. <laughs> I have no freaking idea. <laughs> the, uh, the fact that we do any of this 10th, is kind of yeah, like, tenth. May tenth. See, tenth through twelfth. Yeah, you are. Also right. on the website, you can join the unscripted mail list if you want to hear about when we're going to do these again. And, on and if one person subscribes, it will increase it by 25%. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.